Hello, I'm Dr. Ian McCullough from Johns Hopkins University. This is a short lecture on fake news and rumor correction. Our objectives today uh, is to operationally define some terms associated with fake news and understand um, how certain concepts related to this uh, very talked about concept are very counterintuitive and may cause us to have uh, poor insight into the really kind of cognitive and psychological constructs that's going on. I will also talk a little bit about neural processes involved with influencing counter-arguing and then identify some principles that you may use for countering propaganda as you see it online. So let's start with some terms. Uh, I want to introduce five terms. The first term is misinformation which I'm going to define as just false information that exists in the environment. Uh, that's different than uh, misperception, which is a false belief. So a false belief could be derived from false information or true information, and we'll give you some examples of that in a moment. Deception is the intentional effort to cause others to develop misperceptions, kind of like lying. But there is an intentional aspect of it where you're trying to make people believe something that is not true. Propaganda is information presented in a biased way to intentionally affect the beliefs of others. So propaganda could be true information, but it's going to be presented in a biased way. A great example of that would be in the recent US elections. Uh, the Russian manipulation of uh, the elections was essentially truthful information about a single candidate meant to persuade people uh, in their election outcomes. Attitude is an affinity towards stimulus that affects the neural processing of information. So, you know, you may hear something, do you like that or dislike that, and how does that impact your decision making? So these are some terms we're going to use uh, throughout this lecture. So the first thing I like to talk about is misinformation and misperceptions. So uh, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but not all exposure to misinformation causes misperceptions. So just because you hear something that is not true does not mean that you or most people are going to necessarily believe in it. So there's there's oftentimes um, exaggerated concern over fake information that's thrown out into the information environment. Just because it's out there doesn't mean that people are going to listen to it or agree with it or believe it. The other thing that's important is that not all misperceptions are caused by misinformation. There are cases where truthful information can cause people to have um, misperceptions and, and believe the wrong thing. Um, the other thing that's really kind of counterintuitive but is probably one of the most critical points of the lecture is that you can correct misinformation and misperception but still have a negative attitude towards future information. So in other words when, when somebody puts information out in the information environment and then somebody goes to correct that misperception, there are a lot of negative second and third order effects that come from that. And that's what I think we'll spend a lot of our lecture talking about. So the first issue I want to talk about is belief echoes. And belief echoes, this is uh, presented to me by Emily Thorson. And um, the idea of a belief echo is that when you see misinformation, it can cause a change in your attitude that persists even in those that don't believe the misinformation. And so what does this look like? It typically uh, will involve some sort of celebrity accused of some horrible crime. And then that celebrity, you know, there's a lot of media attention on, on uh, hey, here's all this stuff that this celebrity supposedly did. Then they go into a court. We don't see the details of the court case. They're boring. But, you know, presumably a, a jury of peers look at the evidence and they say, hey, this celebrity's not guilty. Well, then the fact that he's not guilty that all these people that never looked at the facts surrounding the case, never looked at the details, are super angry, there's big massive protests, and everybody's angry about it. What are some examples? You know, supposedly Ben Roethlisberger, uh, quarterback of the Steelers, is a, uh, uh, you know, sexual offender. Uh, supposedly, um, you know, Michael Jackson is a pedophile. Uh, supposedly... Um, you know, O.J. Simpson, okay, well, he probably did do it. But, you know, there's these celebrities that are, these cases or these patterns that we've seen. Um, you know, in, in more recent times, we see this with, um, you know, cases dealing with, like, police violence, right, or or shootings. Uh, and, and, again, it's not like people really dive into the facts, and then there's a, a belief echo. So how are these used? Well, 
If I was going to mount a political campaign, I might say, you know, hey, political candidate A, you know, he's a pedophile and he molests his own kids. And then people go, well, wait a minute. Um, he doesn't have any kids. That's not true. Well, you can correct that information, but the fact that I said candidate A is a pedophile and put that in the information environment creates a negative feeling or repulsion towards that individual regardless of the truth of the, uh, of the matter, whether he did it, whether he had kids or not. And so the more of these belief echoes you throw into the environment, what you're doing is you're affecting people's attitudes towards that individual. And so that's probably one of the main tactics in, in creating belief echoes. And certain political parties uh, do this quite regularly, where they throw out a whole bunch of information, which is later disproven, and the intent of that volume of information is to just create negative sentiment among a populace that's really not going to do the research to, to find out whether it's true or not. So let's talk about inoculation. A lot of times people talk about how do we inoculate people against fake news, right? How do we pre prevent them from, from being influenced by it? This is especially... Uh, um, researched or, or looked at in uh, dealing with like extremist radicalization, right? So if you have, you know, the Islamic State, uh, ISIL, whatever you want to call them, Daesh, uh, in, in Syria and Iraq, and they're recruiting foreign fighters to come and join their fight in Syria and Iraq, like how do we prevent these people from Western societies from being manipulated or influenced by uh, terrorist propaganda? So the general approach to inoculation, which I don't agree with, uh, but the general approach is, uh, this is what they would teach you in an English class on, on persuasive writing. You state a positive message, you then state a refutation, which is like a weak counter-argument. You explain why the refutation is wrong, and then you re-emphasize uh, or echo the positive message. That's the standard model that they do. Well, the problem with this is that when you state any counter-argument at all, weak counter-argument or whatever, you may be creating a belief echo if you're not paying attention or you're not careful. And those belief echoes, as we just explained, can have a lasting negative influential effect on the population and create unintended consequences. Uh, so it's better to inoculate against the source of information than it is the message itself. I'm going to give you an example. Uh, this is an example from Emily Thorson. So um, we're going to use this uh, this case of misinformation, right? So some somebody out there is saying, hey, sugary soda boosts the immune system. Now, hopefully that's absurd enough where you realize that that's like not what happens and I'm not creating a belief echo right now. But uh, let's say that that is a piece of information uh, that, that we think is going to be going out in the information environment. And we want to counter this propaganda. So here are two options. Option one. You may hear that sugary soda boosts the immune system. This is not true, and research shows there is no evidence for this. Soda is bad for you. An alternate counter message, you might hear the sugary lobby try to spread misinformation about sugar. They just want to make money and will mislead you. Sugary soda is bad for you. At this point, I would like you to pause the video and I would like you to think about what the difference is between these two messages and what their impact in terms of belief echoes might be from each of these messages. So go ahead and pause the video. When you have your answers, uh, click play to resume. Welcome back. I'm uh, assuming you've paused the video. You've thought about uh, the two messages and their differences. So here's the difference. In counter message number one, the first sentence is, you may hear that sugary soda boosts the immune system. Well, that is the misinformation. So you have just created the misinformation. You've put out a belief echo. Now, you say this is not true, and research shows there's no evidence for this. So you're correcting the information, but you've already put the information out there to begin with. If we contrast that with message two, you might hear the sugar lobby try to spread misinformation about sugar. They just want to make money and will mislead you. So what we've done here is we have not introduced the idea that sugary soda boosts the immune system. In fact, what we've done is we've attacked the sugar lobby as, as an organization to say, hey, you shouldn't believe anything these people say. We're attacking the source credibility. And then you're giving a justification, right? You're saying they just want to make money and will mislead you. So now you've created your own belief echo that anything the sugar lobby says um, is suspect. 
And then you've re-emphasized the message that you want to push forth, which is sugary soda is bad for you, right? So uh, that is an example of how you might craft a message thinking about belief echoes or how people might use belief echoes to uh, create an influence effect within a population. Changing uh, topics a little bit, I, uh, you heard me say before that misperceptions can be fact-based. Okay. Now, this first fact is, is not exactly true, but like 68% of Americans believe that China owns more than half the U.S. debt. I mean, that, that's a true statement. Uh, the reality is China owns a substantial part of the U.S. debt, probably not f like more than 50%. Okay. But here's the misperception I want to focus in on, right, is many people in the U.S. think that if, uh, if the U.S. does not pay its debt, China can repossess large parts of the United States. Well, that's not true. I mean, we could essentially just give our middle finger to China and say we're not giving you any kind of, um, uh, you know, we're not paying back your debt. And and what would China do? I mean, they would have to go through great lengths to try and 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 uh, resolve that anyway. So, in the U.S., however, you know, while while I would hope politicians realize this, they don't really want to correct the misperception because that might lead to poor voter decision making. And so what we don't really want to do is we don't want to correct the facts because then uh, the misperceptions of facts are, um, are actually helping voters make more responsible decisions because the voters don't really understand the economic implications of fiscal policy for the most part. Right. So misperceptions can be fact based. So not only does, does like a, a lie in the information environment does not necessarily influence people, Truth in the information environment uh, can oftentimes cause people to have false beliefs as well. So what we're going to look at is misinformation correction. And here's just a list of various uh, fake news uh, that, that is out there in the environment. And, and I want you to look at these for a moment and, and think about which ones of these do you think are fake news or not. So pause the video and take a moment to just determine for each of these four items which ones are fake news and which ones are true. Welcome back. I'm assuming you've uh, answered which ones are true and which ones are fake. Uh, the reality is these are all assessed as fake news. And if you and if identified any of them as um, uh, as truthful, then uh, it's really interesting to uh, think about what are your political views that would lead you to think one is true one is not. Um, the other thing that I like to point out with this slide is it can be difficult because there are some people that are dead set that a President Obama was not born in the United States. And there are other people that are equally set that Donald Trump was deliberately colluding with the Russians to win the presidential elections. And convincing them otherwise is very difficult. So now when we're trying to do a scientific study on how people respond to fake news, determining what is actually fake and what isn't is an interesting challenge, and getting ground truth data on that can be very difficult. Let's talk about the first topic about President Obama. And so here's some numbers. In, uh, in April 2011, right, uh, this is before Obama, um, you know, was uh, released any kind of birth certificate or whatever, people were asking, um, do you believe that Obama is a U.S. citizen? And so if you can see my little pointer here, 55% of Americans believed that um, Obama was a U.S. citizen, 15% thought he was not a citizen, and 30% were unsure. And so the people on the opposing camp were like, if Obama would just release his birth certificate, this issue would be over. We would be solved. So in, in April, he uh, released his birth certificate, and, and Adam Brinsky here collected some data on, on attitudes, public opinion, on, uh, on views for uh, uh, this particular topic. So after the release, as you'd expect, more people believe that, that Obama was in fact a U.S. citizen, and uh, fewer people thought he was not, and a lot more people that were unsure before now believe that he is in fact a U.S. citizen. What's interesting to me is look what happens uh, on nine months after the release of the birth certificate. You all of a sudden see that the number of people believing he's a U.S. citizen uh, goes back to 59%. All right, so it goes back to kind of the pre-release levels. But look here, more people now believe that he is not a U.S. citizen than before he released his birth certificate. 
And when you get to a little over a year after the release of the birth certificate, you have the same number of people thinking that he was in fact a U.S. citizen, and you have more people believing he's not after he released the birth certificate. And of course, these numbers are even uh, stronger among the uh, Republican candidates because you know they're they're more likely to want to believe that Obama was an illegitimate president as far as uh, as far as that goes. But here's the thing: is when you introduce corrections into the information environment, we think that that should just, you know, here's evidence that should correct people's views. Uh, we find it doesn't. It actually uh, causes counter-arguing, which is where people begin to uh, engage their brain, not to evaluate the veracity of the evidence, but to come up with logical reasons why they should dismiss the information that they've just faced. Right, so in the uh, issue with Obama, it was, well, it's not his long form birth certificate. So, you know, this is obviously a forgery. Well, I don't know if you've ever tried to get your long-form birth certificate, right? But uh, when I called and asked for mine, they're like, what are you talking about? We have a birth certificate. What's the difference between a short form and a long form? Now, some states might have long forms and short forms, but it seems to me that Obama released the birth certificate he had and one that would allow you to get a U.S. passport and be su sufficient proof of citizenship. But you have people that do not want to accept that, and so you actually end up creating this counter-arguing, this discussion, which leads to more people not believing the truth than, uh, than did before. Now, I'm not looking to get into a political debate as far as what you believe or don't believe. My point is simply that when you think that putting out information to correct the record is beneficial, uh, that is not scientifically supported. I'm going to give you another example. Uh, this is also from Adam Berinsky, and this is a paper from your uh, required reading for this module. So uh, this is an excerpt from that paper. You can read the paper for the full details. But essentially, there's misinformation, right? So the misinformation he's looking at is that, uh, you know, there are going to be death panels in the uh, health care reform, right? So this is Obamacare, and, and death panel is basically saying that you have to I think the actual uh, law legislation was you have to inform elderly people about their options for end-of-life care, which may include euthanasia, right? Uh, that was manipulated in the environment to say, oh, you're going to have the government deciding when to pull the plug on grandma, right? So obviously some charged views there. And so here is some information, and we've highlighted in yellow the relevant bits here. You know, hey, will there be death panels? And you know, making it mandatory that people in Medicare have required counseling that will tell them how to end their life sooner. And you have every right to fear you should not have the government run plan decide when to pull the plug on grandma, right? So that's the misinformation case. Then we have misinformation with correction, right? So now we've said, hey, setting the record straight. We add these things that says, hey, the American Medical Association, National Hospice and Palliative Care organizations support the provision. We also have John Rother, executive vice president of AARP. The seniors lobby repeatedly declared the death panel rumors false. Right. So this is this is what we mean by misinformation correction. Okay. So so what are the numbers on this? Right. So if we draw your attention to the no line, right, we have several conditions. So no is you know how many people believe that the Obamacare requires euthanasia, right? So no is the, is, the, is the view here. So in the control condition where you've only exposed people to truthful information, you know, we have, uh, you know, 58 uh, people um, are, are, you know, going to say uh, uh, no, which is the correct answer. When you see the rumor, uh, you see that 43%. So you see this difference, right? So this is showing that, that when people are exposed to the rumor only, they are less likely to believe the truth, right? 43 versus 58. Then when you do this rumor, then show people the correction, right? It is about the same as the control group, right? So that, that's a good finding because it basically says that, hey, when you immediately correct the rumor, you know, people are going to believe uh, on the same levels as if they just saw the factual information up front. What's interesting is if a Republican corrects the information, and this is like not supporting Republican views, then people are more likely to believe the truth, right? 68 versus 58, and that's well established that when somebody is um, is advocating against their best interests, they're just a more believable source. Okay, and then with the Democrats uh, correcting it, you, you see that number. 
what I want to, what I think is really interesting is look what happens two weeks later. At two weeks later, we see people that have been exposed to the control and rumor group, right? That's 57 and 43. That's very comparable to the 58 and 43 immediately, right? So there's there's not a whole lot of change. Look what happens with rumor plus correction. It decreases, right? So this is the impact of that counter arguing and that boomerang effect. So what we see is that when you do rumor correction, it does not actually um, last, right? It's it's very uh, short lived, and and that correction decays very quickly over time. And so that's the key finding with with uh, rumor correction when you're dealing with fake news. So. Misinformation is very sticky when it's placed. Fact-based correction fades over time and can often create a boomerang effect where people believe more in the opposite direction. So if you're really wanting to deal with this, attacking source credibility is much more significant and creating belief echoes, right? If you do it in your, in your way to uh, address uh, source credibility can oftentimes be a more effective tactic. And I think in U.S. politics uh, during the Trump administration, especially early in his administration, we see a lot of that where, um, you know, not that he helps himself, but you see um, a lot of people attacking him, his credibility as a president, as an individual. Uh, again, I'm trying to be uh, party agnostic here. I'm, I'm just pointing out the fact that a lot of people in the media are addressing the way he uh, conducts himself in the presidency and the things he says. And of course, all of that volume of discussion uh, increases belief echoes, which I think adversely affects uh, people's sentiment towards him. I think that his attempts to correct the record with accusations to the press um, do not necessarily serve his interests in terms of correcting the record. I think they actually cause people to be um, more against him uh, as a result of the uh, information that he uh, that, that he puts forth. Forth. It will be interesting to see how uh, the next um, election after his first term uh, plays out. Uh, if there's any change in tactics or if there is uh, uh, you know any change in the way uh, uh, these things are, are going forward. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about how people cognitively process information. So. Uh, I'm going to draw your attention to the upper left chart. So when somebody receives new information, what goes on, right? So the first question that must be asked is, is the audience aware of the message, right? So, you know, take, take a political issue, you know, like, hey, should we should we implement gun control policy X, either pro-gun or uh, gun control, right? Wh whichever your, uh, your view is. But let's just say, that's just to give you some context. So let's say there's a message. First thing is, are people aware of the issue of gun control in this context? Um, and if they're not, do they care about it? Have they ever thought about the issue before? And if they don't really care about guns at all, well, then you might do some priming, but you really haven't shaped any opinion. There's no influence going on here. There's just, you know, okay, I've heard a little bit about that. Okay, let's say they get to this part of the flowchart and they do care about the message. They say, I've never thought about guns before, but that sounds like an intelligent thing to worry about. Uh, there's been a shooting at, at whatever school. Hey, uh, I care. At this point, uh, we activate system two thinking. So system one thinking is just kind of like, you know, first impressions. It's, uh, you know, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book, Blink, about system one thinking, you know, or, or, or just kind of gut reaction. System two thinking is where we actually think a little bit more deliberately, a little bit more logically about it. And it's at this point that rhetorical persuasion kicks in and people can actually think about ethos, pathos, logos, right? Uh, so this is everything you learned in your English composition class about how do you write persuasively will actually help opinion formation. Well, now the next time the audience hears a message, they've already heard about it. So they don't ever enter that part of the chart. They instead uh, come over here and they say, is the message they've just heard consistent with their opinion on the issue that they've already formed? And if it is, well, again, system one thinking, they don't think too much about it. It just kind of reinforces those views. That's fine. If, they, if, it, if the information disagrees, right, the evidence disagrees with what they already believe, this is where they begin to have counter-arguing go on in their brain. And this is a system two process. But system two is not invoked to logically evaluate the evidence they saw. System two is invoked to think about justification or rationale as to why they should not believe the information they just heard. So the next question is, is the counter-arguing disrupted? And if the counter-arguing is not disrupted, then what we end up having is polarization away from the message. So if you're position A, 
and somebody gives you a bunch of evidence as to why position B is really the truth, but you're position A, you're going to become more in favor of position A for all the facts about why position B is right, right? And that is the counter-arguing process. If you're able to disrupt this counter-arguing, then you're actually able to get to change, because then you can you can disrupt the counter-arguing and get people to think about the new evidence, and that's where you end up with change. So that leads to kind of three or four options, uh, or four questions you have to ask of the audience. Does the audience have any pre-existing views or opinions? Uh, what is their current opinion? What makes them care? And what are the options to disrupt counter-arguing? And there's, there's essentially three. Uh, you can give them uh, distraction, you can give them affirmations, say nice things about them, uh, or you can do narrative transport. Narrative transport is where you tell them a story and that story models uh, some sort of change or, or view that you want to change. So neuroscience gives us the ability to actually measure some of these key constructs in the brain. Now a lot of processes in the brain are distributed across the brain and it's very hard to localize where they, where they occur in particular. And most of our decision making is from a very deep part of the brain, it's very emotional, and then our logic uh, comes to rationalize uh, those decisions later. But there's some very interesting areas that are very accessible and localized in the brain that allow us to study uh, persuasion. So the uh, blue area that you see there is narrative immersion. So the extent to which you get engrossed with a story, right, that becomes that blue area. Uh, the uh, the green area on the picture here is the in the medial prefrontal cortex is this area where you you start to internalize the message of ad or stimulus that you're looking at. So you know if you get engrossed in a story, you might see activity uh, kind of in this dorsal area of the brain um, up here, and then as you begin to internalize it, you'll actually see the activity move down the medial prefrontal cortex as it becomes kind of incorporated into your worldview. The area of the brain that's associated with counter-arguing is in this right lateral prefrontal cortex area that you see over here in yellow. And so the lines here are showing correlations. So as the counter-arguing area of your brain becomes more active, it's, it's inversely correlated with activity in the dorsal and medial prefrontal cortex and the medial prefrontal cortex. So as, as your area of your brain becomes active that starts counter-arguing, it disrupts your ability to process the message. If you can disrupt the counter-arguing area of your brain, then you can actually get to a better effect with messaging. And so that's an example of where um, we see this correlation. Causation is a little bit more difficult to show and needs more research. But as we tell stories and we activate that blue area of the brain that, that is paying attention to the stories, it's much easier for people to incorporate that into their worldview and actually have, have change. So counter-arguing is, is the key obstacle to persuasion that we face. And so I would argue that any kind of, you know, I'm going to use a military example here from my military background, but I would say that a frontal information assault is foolish. When you start telling somebody, hey, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right, look at my evidence, look at my evidence, all you're doing is you're, it's like the military equivalent of rushing across an open field against a well-defended, dug-in enemy with a lot of weapon systems pointed right there. You're not going to be successful in that fight. What you need to think about is how am I going to breach the counter-arguing? How am I going to come up with stories, affirmation, distraction that's going to allow me to, to lower the audience's defense mechanisms so that I can actually deliver the facts, the information, whatever it is that I'm going to use to try and convince or persuade. I think you need to reframe the discussion. That's kind of like the equivalent of flanking in that military example, where you maybe need to set your own narrative engagement area. You need to reframe the discussion. So if people don't like, you know, um, the uh, uh, pro-choice movement, how do they reframe it? They reframe it as pro-life, right? We don't see anti-choice, right? That doesn't, that's not an effective frame in the debate, nor is anti-life, not an effective uh, frame. So you have reframing that is attempting to focus on different issues and take initiative in the space, and that's how you have more effective persuasion. And I would call this expanded maneuver. Uh, from like kind of a military context. How do you maneuver in that influence space in a more effective way? Um, 
I like to use neuroscience uh, to to study and investigate this. So these are just some pictures of a, of a study I did about a year ago where we were investigating uh, neural synchrony. So neural synchrony is similarity in neural patterns in key brain regions are highly predictive of friendship formation and cooperation. So in my study, we uh, recruited a bunch of highly polarized sectarian Iraqi Sunnis and Shias. We had them... Uh, think through a politically charged issue, and we either prime them initially with conciliatory messages or argumentative messages. And then we had them work on a task together, which you see in the middle, all while they were equipped with uh, neural imaging machines from a very uh, small, lightweight, portable neural imaging machine. And so uh, if you're interested in, in exploring that a little further, I do teach a class in the systems engineering uh, part of uh, engineering for professionals program uh, called engineering and measuring influence. And it involves how to use neural imaging, uh, a little bit more about influence and persuasion, eye tracking, and some of these sorts of systems. Uh, and the data analysis uh, side of that is, is really cool. And I think an interesting area uh, to, uh, you know, for future, uh, future exploration. I think there's a definite future career in that area. Um, and then uh, the, the guy on the lower right there is uh, al-Bashir. So uh, he's kind of like a, a famous comedian, the uh, Iraqi John Stewart. Saw him on a coffee shop when I was in Amman, Jordan, and uh, went up. He didn't believe I knew who he was. Uh, when, I, when he was convinced, I, I did. He asked what I was doing. I told him I'm doing neuroscience. He wanted to make a video for my experiment. So I'm like, of course you can. And so uh, I went and got a few other uh, counter-sectarian advertisements and then did a comparative study uh, on that. Okay, um, I digress. Uh, getting back to a couple issues more relevant to social media and, uh, and, and the topics of the class, um, it's important we understand social proof in the context of influence. So social proof is this idea that people are going to assume the actions of others in a community in an attempt to reflect quote, correct behavior. So uh, we saw this in, uh, uh, we call it normative conformity when we look at ASH uh, studies. And, and so basically normative conformity is you're, you're following the group norms. What's interesting about this is when people are following group norms, if they don't necessarily agree with it, right? So if they have opinion A and they're modeling opinion B so that they have this social proof, they're fitting in with a group, that creates a cognitive dissonance. And it either causes the person to revise their opinion, this is the conformity, or it causes them to decide to distance themselves from that group and find another. And, and the effect that has in social media is people tend to use their interests, their political views as a filter, and they tend to seek out communities online that reinforce their existing beliefs. And because of the advanced expanse of, of the internet, they're able to uh, find a lot more groups and, and have a lot better likelihood of finding a group that kind of reinforces whatever views they have. Then the social proof is just reinforcing these views and it gets more and more polarized. Uh, so social networks um, are important. They give us a way of understanding where these communities exist. They give us a way to think through how we can influence them. So here's a couple examples uh, to kind of uh, demonstrate this point. So on the left, we see five fake news stories that were broadcast. And so Silverman and Singer Vine, they asked, how many people have seen these these stories? And so you see that it's actually a very small percentage of the people that have seen the fake news stories. So then the second question is, um, how accurate do you think the fake news stories are? And so you can see the reported uh, percentage of people that saw the story, whether they believe it. And our interpretation of these numbers, you can think about it for a little while, but the interpretation of these numbers is the people that are seeing the stories are far more likely to believe them than people that did not see the stories. Okay, so why is that? Well, if you look at a typical information diet, where in this chart uh, to the upper right, red is going to be conservatives or Republicans, blue is Democrats or liberals, gray is uh, independents, uh, a normal information diet on this scale where the right is conservative news, the left is liberal news, and zero is central, um, if you look at that chart, you'll see that that should be a normal information diet where conservatives and liberals are, are seeing the same news broadcasts. And what happens in a two-stage model is uh, opinion leaders within social networks look at the main news broadcast, they take the information that's presented, and then they, they kind of color it with their view, and then that's how they shape the opinions in their group. So I'll give you an example. Um, during the Bush administration, 
they asked you know, Republicans and Democrats uh, how much role the president had in affecting oil prices. And what they found is when Bush was president, Bush W, was uh, that 75% um, roughly of uh, Democrats felt that the president had a lot of control over the oil prices. Republicans, uh, you know, 25 percent, one in four thought that uh, the president had, you know, control over oil prices. When Obama became president and the same question was asked of a random sample, they found that now three out of four Republicans felt the president had uh, an ability to affect oil prices and only one out of four Democrats. So same issue. And what we see is the opinion on on whether the president is enacting a policy that's good or bad, same policy, same situation, is really colored by their political viewpoint and whether they want to see the president in a favorable or unfavorable light, right? So, so that's an example of how the same information diet uh, can be used and people can have very different views on the situation. When we look at, um, when we look at online media sources, right to the right we see that that the actual information diet is far more skewed so you see that there are is this bimodal hump to the right uh, with a lot more republican leaning um, uh, sources and then to the left with uh, liberal leaning sources now if you look at the headers on there you know you'll see that like fox news uh, is reported as a, a right leaning source and um, i think msn and cnn are kind of centrist and so your opinion on whether that's true or not is really going to be affected by by your personal opinions just like whoever created this chart I, I think had some bias in how they constructed that and that's one of the challenges we have when studying fake news as a research topic getting ground truth data what, I, what I'll bring your attention to, though, is of these sites, right, when they classify what's a mainstream news site and what's a fake news site, um, what we see is how do people get the information? So on this top uh, bar, right, we see that almost half of information is direct browsing. That is where somebody goes in, I'm going to go to CNN. They type in CNN, they go to the news site. Or I'm going to type in Fox News, they go to the news site, right? Uh, search engine is where they put in a topic, you know, like, what did Trump do today? And then they see what evidence came up. That's search engine results. And then social media for top news stories only accounts for about 10% of people hitting those sites. When we look at fake news sites, however, we see that over 40% of people uh, hit fake news sites from social media. So while... Uh, so while fake news is not necessarily prevalent in the information environment and only a minority of people see it, uh, you're much more likely to see it through social media channels than you are through other uh, mainstream news sites. So how people search for information, how they view it, what's determined as credible is an important uh, thing for us to research and consider. So key findings are fake news are much more likely to be viewed and believed by those with a skewed information diet. And the polarization comes first. People use their interests and their biases to select communities that are advocating those views. And then that's where polarization increases. It's not that the fake news sites are necessarily polarizing people. People tend to seek out that uh, information. It's the same with uh, foreign fighters being radicalized to go fight in Syria and Iraq for uh, terrorist groups. It's not so much that the terrorist groups have some really clever and awesome ad campaign that recruits people. We find that people that are uh, lacking social acceptance, lacking a sense of purpose, lacking a sense of control in their life, might experience undue racism and prejudice. Those people begin to seek out alternatives and might find the extremist groups. And so it's that initial Initial polarization, right? That initial seeking out, uh, and then once they enter the echo chamber, then those views are reinforced. So uh, we talked about social proof. It's people's perception of the environment that is uh, that is affecting their view. So I want to show you two networks. In both of these networks, same number of nodes, same network structure, and let's say the red represents an extremist or minority view. Well. You, as, a, as an individual in the network, don't get to do a public opinion poll and know what everybody thinks. You only know what your neighbors think, the people that you're immediately connected to. So if we look for each actor in the network and said, what proportion of their neighbors have the red minority view or not? Well, we can see that on the network on the left, almost all of the actors think that more than half their friends in their neighborhood uh, believe the minority view. So people in the network on the left are going to believe that most people have this red view. 
If you look at the right, there's only two actors that, that even half their friends uh, or, or their neighbors uh, uh, have the minority view. So the people on the right are going to say, you know what, most people don't have the red view. So same network, same structure, same number of people with the minority view, but the way that network is structured is going to have an impact on whether or not they believe the majority has this minority view, and that's called the majority illusion. It's affected by two factors, and uh, which is the, the assortativity, which is the extent to which high degree nodes are connected to low degree nodes, and the exposure or the degree of the nodes with the small view. So uh, you'll see that these red nodes happen to have higher degree than the majority of the people in the network. Right, the same structure. So assortativity would be uh, a property if we if we varied the structure of do high degree nodes talk to other high degree nodes or do they talk to low degree nodes to what extent? Okay, so the majority illusion is where people then think that the minority is actually the majority, and this feeds into this concept called pluralistic ignorance, which is that the misperception of the social norm drives your behavior. Right. So an example of that is college drinking. In many studies, when you ask uh, undergraduates uh, how many beers they drink at a party or how many drinks they have, they'll report like three to five on average. When you ask them, well, how many do all your friends drink? They tend to report, you know, six to six to ten. So everybody in college generally thinks that um, their peers are drinking more than them, doing more drugs and having more promiscuous sex. And so those perceptions, right, which we call pluralistic ignorance, drives them to drink more, be more likely to do drugs, and have more promiscuous sex. And then when they leave that community and they think that the norms change, then they resume to modeling what they believe the social norms are. So to the extent in which you can engineer a majority illusion or understand or detect a majority illusion online gives you an interesting way of thinking about interventions and, and how do you actually uh, help protect people against fake news and influence in those uh, settings. Or if you're on the other side, how do you, how do you promote an ad campaign or uh, intervention? Here's an example of where we have studied this across about 100 different uh, online social movements, right? So firestorms, we call them. These are large negative word of mouth campaigns. So just looking at the assortativity level in these networks as they change, so these are new people coming into the network, the network structure changing as a function of retweets and mentions, right? We, we see that there are some structures that are what we call a popular start. So these are where a celebrity or corporate uh, actor did this, right? So they, they had a, a position where high degree nodes were advocating this view up front. And if you look at the assortativity, it starts out highly negative, and then it kind of levels out at this uh, pattern somewhere around here at a negative 0.3 or negative 0.4, right? Um, when we look at, at grassroots campaigns, so these are things like, you know, the cancel Colbert is where uh, there was a bit that the Colbert show had that was uh, uh, racially offensive towards Asians. And so there was a big uh, campaign to cancel Colbert because of its uh, offense. Uh, that was started by um, a, a personality that, that didn't have a particularly large uh, Twitter following initially. Uh, similar with uh, bo boycotting Rolling Stone for one of their articles. And so what we see is that that assortativity starts out low, but it has to get somewhat negative before it adopts this pattern where it kind of levels out, right? So again, we see that the impact of assortativity and degree exposure does have some impact in um, any kind of online firestorm social media movement. Now our work uh, that we've done to date, uh, we haven't been able to find any definitive patterns that would uh, that would really result in, in a super nice finding. Uh, and so uh, if you're interested in exploring this further for your final project, you can talk to me, uh, send me an email, and, and we can try and help shape that with some of the uh, more uh, uh, modern work that we've, uh, we've been doing since uh, this uh, study. So, Conclusion, um, the biggest thing for dealing with fake news and influence online is we have to avoid naive tactics, right? So don't have a myopic focus on the fake news and the misinformation. Understand that it exists within a cognitive and network ecosystem that uh, is more complex uh, than you would think. Facts and rhetoric are not effective means of persuasion. So the, the fact that you're going to like, the, the thought that you're going to like give some people information, logical reasons, and they're going to change their mind is... Um, 
is just not supported empirically. Uh, for those of you that have been in a relationship, imagine when you're fighting with your significant other, and, and what are you doing? You think that the next piece of information you're going to give your significant other, that he or she is going to be like, oh, I didn't know that. I, I apologize. Please forgive me. You're absolutely right which happens never in the history of any argument between couples because that's not how our brains work, right? The more facts you give your significant other as to why you're right in the situation, the more your significant other thinks you're a jerk and gets more and more angry at you, and that's the counter-arguing that's going on. How do you disrupt that? Well, you have to do things like affirmation, like, oh, you're a wonderful person, you're so smart. You know, you gotta give them some affirmation, maybe tell them a story, maybe distract them, you know? Hey, look at the cat, that's pretty cute. Now, what I was really saying was, right, something along those lines, right? You have to think about this maneuver, right? And, and contesting the space that you know that you just got to put your view out there so that people are considering it. Uh, these don't work. They actually have an, a negative effect. Right? They they do the opposite. Um, and so we can think about how we can do more data-driven tactics. And if you're really wanting to be effective, it's important that you think about ways to test your messages on a smaller representative group, uh, whether it's neural imaging uh, to get at kind of implicit measures or whether you just do straight up opinion surveys and ask people, uh, you need to do something to make sure that your uh, messages are actually resonating effectively with the audience. So we've covered quite a lot in this lecture. Uh, we've talked about belief echoes, uh, the impacts of correcting misinformation, uh, we've talked a lot about uh, counter-arguing, whether it's uh, the, the neural mechanisms of that or how that actually plays out in, uh, you know, in, in arguments. We talked a little bit about interest filters and how that can kind of uh, play into majority illusions where, where people begin to think that uh, this minority view is actually held by more people than it really is. And that affects pluralistic ignorance and then social uh, conformity beyond that. Uh, we've also touched on how social network analysis can play into all of these uh, factors. So this has been a lecture on uh, fake news and rumor correction. I appreciate you listening. This is Dr. Ian McCullough from Johns Hopkins University.